Sam Cedar on the Majority Report. Emma Vigland out today. I want to welcome back to the program Brian Concanon. He is a human rights lawyer and executive director of the Institute for Justice and Democracy in Haiti. Uh, Brian, uh, welcome back to the program. Well, thanks for having me back again, Sam. And even more importantly, thanks for covering Haiti. Well, I think, you know, I think the last time we spoke may have been in the wake, and I, I can't quite uh, recall this, but may have been in the wake of the assassination of, of, uh, of Joven uh, Moise. Um, and that was about two years ago, uh, maybe 30 months ago now. And, um, and um, w- just uh, give us a little bit of that history of how uh, Moise uh, got into office and, and just sort of so that we can set the table here for what the U.S. agenda has been. We've talked in the past on this program about the U.S. agenda that has been there for uh, decades, maybe, you know, over a century. We've talked about how, um, you know, Haiti had the only um, independence, uh, war of independence, I guess one could call it, uh, in throwing off um, the colonial powers in this uh, hemisphere and one that they literally had to pay France for for uh over 100 years because they had denied france their slaves um but uh, uh fill us in on the sort of the recent history yeah haitians would love to hear your account because they insist that the history needs to start with them becoming independent in a world run by countries that got their power through slavery and how the world could not allow them to succeed. And they would say that exact same dynamic is still in play. I mean, the powerful countries in the world are still the countries that for the most part that got their power through slavery and Haitians continue to be to be punished. The most recent developments on that. So so uh, President Moise, and I think as we discussed 30 months ago, had been uh, had overstayed his term. It was violation of the Constitution, but the U.S. supported him, so he stayed. Uh, two days before he left, he he announced that uh, a man named Ariel Henry would be his prime minister, but Henri was never actually installed. Uh, Moise was killed. Everybody agreed that another person, uh, Claude Joseph, who had been prime minister, would continue in that spot. But then a week later, the a, an organization called the Core Group, which is a group of countries no Haitians included, led by the United States, the core group put installed uh, Henri as prime minister through a press release. And so since then, for the last two and a half years, Henri has served as prime minister with no Haitian uh, electoral or civil society or constitutional support, but he has been propped up consistently by the by the U.S. government, and so he stayed in. Um, Haiti during that time has continued to degrade. The PHTK party, which has basically run Haiti for the last dozen years, has has been uh, persistently dismantling the democracy. Parliament hasn't met since 2019. There has not been a, a single elected official in office in Haiti for over a year. The police force have been has been uh, politicized. The courts have been politicized. The press has been cowed. And this process has has continued inexorably over the last 30 months. The what's happened over the last uh, 24 hours. Let, with- let me let me let me stop you there for a second. Just what are the mechanisms? I mean, and and we could, we should also probably talk about the intent too with the U.S. But but what are the mechanisms when they prop up a guy like uh, Henri? Like what is what are the mechanisms that are used there? Is it just basically, uh, uh, I mean, h- how does that happen? How, uh, you know, like, and what does that mean? And, and really like, is it, is it just basically within Port-au-Prince or is it within like 20% of Port-au-Prince? I mean, like, what does it mean for the U S uh, to prop up, uh, a, a leader there? And then we should also probably just touch on what are the, what is it that they want out of Haiti that it makes it, you know, the, the effort to prop up a leader is expended. Yeah, the U.S. has been propping up Henri by sending him money. 
Uh, they've been propping him up by providing international diplomatic support and making sure he gets loans from the International Monetary Fund and other international financial institutions. And they've been propping him up by insisting that, that Henri be in office and be part of Haiti's solution. And what has happened over the, the last couple of years, Haitian civil society keeps coming up with um, with alternatives, with broad-based platforms that would move Haiti towards fair elections. The U.S. keeps giving Henri a veto by saying, well, he has to be part of it or we're not going to let it work. And what that does is it completely distorts all of the incentives. Henri, as long as he has U.S. supporting, he has support, he has no incentive to compromise towards fair elections because he could never win fair elections. And by not compromising, he's been able to stay in office for 30 months, which is the longest prime ministerial term in at least 40 years in Haiti. So basically with no constitutional or popular support, he's Haiti's longest serving prime minister uh, because he got the U.S. support. Another big part of how the U.S. has been supporting him, back in 2021 when there were uh, widespread protests against Henri's rule, he called for an international force basically to prop him up. The U.S. has been trying very hard to make that work ever since. And um, it hasn't yet happened, but there's currently a, a proposed and U.N. Security Council um, authorized mission led by Kenya that is, you know, the U.S. is still trying to get it to come to Haiti. And the U.S. actually made accepting that force a condition of anybody who wanted to play a role in, in, the, uh, in Haiti's government after Henri resigns. All right. So, uh, so as far as like, you know, what, what's been going on with this, in fact, uh, Henri was in Kenya. Uh, is that not right? Um, just, just uh, 24 hours ago, that's where he was heading back and he's been out of the country. But the idea is that the U S is basically saying, and Kenya and Haiti had no relations. And I, they I not had, they not had diplomatic relations, diplomatic until relations. September. no relations at all. Yeah. And so it was basically the U S shopping around for mm -hmm. a, uh, for an African country that, uh, so that it would I, ostensibly be, um, uh, black soldiers in Haiti. Um, one who was, who had a, um, I guess a, uh, competent enough military that also was interested in, uh, us aid. So the U S is going around saying like, we'll pay you to, uh, come in and basically be our proxy military in mm -hmm. Haiti, uh, so that we won't have, you know, white faces down there with guns telling the Haitians what to do. You will be our military. We will pay you. And, and there were problems in Kenya with this because there was a lot of Kenyans who were like, we don't want to do this, but the U S is coming in with like an offer. You can barely refuse. Yep. And the U S first tried to get Canada. Canada refused and said, this is a bad idea. It's not going to work propping up a hated government. They asked CARICOM, the Caribbean countries, they refused. They asked Brazil, Brazil refused. They asked countries in West Africa. They refused. And it was really Kenya who had no interest in Haiti, but did have interest in U.S., hundreds of millions of U.S. dollars that finally got, got Kenya to agree. But once they agreed, Kenya sent an exploratory mission to see what was happening. The exploratory mission said, no, we're not going to do that. We're going to revise the mission to where, you know, where it's much less combative. The U.S. said no, wrong answer, and forced them to retake it. Just in the last uh, two hours, we've heard another uh, report that Kenya is saying, well, maybe we're not going to do it after all. We don't know if they're just trying to get more money out of the U.S. or they're serious about about uh, about pulling out. But uh, it, that's a developing story. What? OK, so what is the U.S. interest in uh, all of these machinations? What is it that um, you uh, and uh, I mean, it, it's hard to imagine it's a national security issue. Uh, but I imagine it is a sort of, uh, there are corporate interests that we are trying to protect in some fashion. It's less direct corporate interests. I think in the short term, the Biden administration wants to keep a lid on Haiti. So they're not blamed for anything happening in Haiti during an election year. I think in the long term, it's what you already alluded to. It's that Haiti had the bad example of being a free country in a world run by slave owning powers. If 
today it's basically the same type of thing if haitian voters were allowed to elect the people they wanted to they would elect strong progressive leaders who would go challenge the international order of which haiti has the very short end and of which we in america have the long end i mean to a large extent the prosperity that that we that i that you and so many other americans enjoy is a lot to a large part based on our ability to exploit less powerful countries. And if we're not able to do that, it is going to affect our, our lifestyle. And when Haiti did elect a, a strong progressive president in, in 2000, he did challenge the United States. He went to the UN and gave speeches about the international economic order. He made a demand for reparations on France. And because of that, the US and France got together and they literally kidnapped him because we can't accept that Haiti be a bad example of, of liberation. If Hades, and this is exactly what Thomas Jefferson said back in 1802, and it's still the case, there's a fear that if Hades allowed to be an example of, you know, of sovereignty, then other countries are going to demand that too. And, and there'll be a domino effect. And pretty soon that will, in fact, um, challenge our, our preeminent place in the world. All right. So we were talking, you're talking about Aristide and, you know, and I, and it's, I think it's hard for people to really fully sort of make sense of the idea because it's not tangible uh, on some level. I mean, it's, you know, we, we've had examples in the past. I mean, I think, you know, uh, there's, there's some talk about the minimum wage uh, being raised there and that would increase the cost of, of maybe some clothing that we get in this country. Among other things, there may be also uh, 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 other products, but the this story about France, you know, when Aristide wanted um, uh, to be uh, wanted uh, um, uh, basically compensation for what Haiti had had paid, and I think um, I, I learned this from you, I think, or I, I I can't quite remember, but when Haiti overthrew the slavery um, regime that France had imposed upon it. Haiti, because France obviously then had a navy, could do a blockade and basically starve uh, Haiti out. Haiti agreed to pay back France the value of what France lost in the form of the slavery in terms of their own labor and like as commodities. And they were paying this fee off for something like 160, 70 years. I mean, up until... What was it at the almost like in the until the, the 1940s until the 1940s 140 years I guess or so and um and to be a country period at that time never mind one that is doesn't necessarily have a a huge um uh, uh well is not employing slaves essentially to create wealth and to have this ongoing bill, it's like, you know, uh, being dragged down by student debt uh, well into your 60s. Um, honestly, like you can't you can't build any wealth. You can't invest money into your own infrastructure. And it leaves you like in a permanent state of of a sort of um, arrested development, if you will, in terms of your economy and in terms of your infrastructure. And so he was looking for this money back. And we're in an era where that is not. It's not impossible that maybe uh, at least the international order would say, OK, well, that's probably the case. They shouldn't have had to have paid that. And so this is it really is just to keep in check any type of nationalism, particularly within the southern hemisphere. Nationalism that will challenge the existing world order. I mean, the U.S., you know, and you know this, especially in Latin America, the U.S. has tolerated nationalist regimes that are on the right that aren't going to challenge the existing order. It's it's nationalist regimes on the left that is the problem. And Haitians will remind you that, you know, it wasn't just France in 1804. That's they, they, you know, they got their independence from Napoleon, but the U.S. refused to recognize Haiti. You know, interesting, President John Adams, before independence, was helping the Haitians. He said, hey, they're like us. They're, you know, they want independence. And if they get independence, that can, that can uh, you know, stretch throughout the hemisphere. Thomas Jefferson believed the same thing, except he believed it was a bad thing. So when Jefferson comes into power, he says, the Haitians are going to take over or their, their, their example of liberty is going to take over. We need to stop it. And that's been our policy ever since. We've gone with Jefferson rather than Adams. So um, 
the um, the Kenyans have said we we may not be interested in this deal. Uh, the U.S. like this morning, I guess, announced a hundred million dollars that they were going to pay uh, Kenya to be the proxy military, uh, and they were also gonna- more. That's on top of several oh. hundred million more that has okay. already been promised. And they are also going to uh, provide another thirty three million dollars in uh, aid to Haiti. If Kenya says no, what what then? You know, they're going to keep finding, keep looking. They'll keep raising the price and either Kenya or someone else, I think, will eventually take over the mission because eventually the price is going to be right. And that's, what, that's, the, that's the plan, I'm sure. And, 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 and the, that's stage one. And stage two is to get uh, a, install another leader in Haiti that is, again, essentially in the pocket of the U.S., Yes, it's it's slightly more nuanced. So what happened last night in negotiations in Jamaica, the, the U.S. under the auspices of CARICOM brought together um, a lot of Haitians. It was called a negotiation, but it was more an audition. They brought some political parties that had a chance of winning fair elections, some that did not. And they said, look, you all have to get together and and come up with a transitional government. And the first requirement for being part of this transitional government is to agree to this illegal occupying force. So obviously sovereignty is limited from the beginning, but they also required that the government get one of the seven seats, that there are other political parties that have alliances with gangs gets one of gets parts of the seven seats. And so what it looks like going forward is that you're going to have seven people named to this transition. They're going to be, you know, across the ideological spectrum, they're going to be a very broad range of how of their commitment to democracy and their ability to win fair elections and that is somehow going to lead towards elections i mean i think there is i don't want to be too pessimistic i think there is a, a, an opportunity although limited for some improvement in democracy but it's going to be sharply limited again because of the rules that that have been set up um going forward what we, what should we look for in terms of possible indicators as to which way this is going to go um i think it depends on you know whether the 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 international mission is a big deal i mean as long as that's deployed that is a deep limitation of haitian sovereignty and democracy you know if if the best case scenario on that would be that you allow um some kind of legitimate haitian government to decide how the international community can help. You know, there are good arguments that Haitians are making it that they need international forces, but everybody in civil society says we don't need an occupying force that was really designed to prop up this hated government. Um, so how the international, the international community has a chance to do better by Haiti by allowing Haitians to make the call as to how the international community can help, whether troops are useful or not and what kind of troops and what they should do. The second is just the mechanics of of, of, of the election. You know, if it moves forward, if there's basic freedom in the sense that all candidates are allowed to participate, um, again, there's a long history of U.S. supported governments having elections that the U.S. calls good, but they eliminate their opponents through uh, through pretext in the in the candidate registration process. So we need to make sure that all candidates are allowed to run. And then on election day itself, you'd actually need to have a fair election, not it's not characterized by by the fraud that has actually characterized every single election run under the PHTK party in the last 10 years. Um, lastly, what's a, what's a good book uh, for our audience to read if they want to get a primer on uh, Haitian history and um, and uh, the U.S. obviously a big part of that? Yeah, there's lots of good ones. A fantastic one just came out. Uh, it's by Jake Johnston. It's called Aid State. Uh, that's you know up to date and and a good encapsulation of of the whole picture. All right, great. We'll put a link to that and uh, to your some of the pieces also. I think that you've written recently for I mean just this past week. Um, I yeah. the, you I had a sense from on, I, I, on I responsible had a, statecraft. Yes, uh, we have those. And uh, just uh, like you know, a week ago, you it, it it felt like you had a sense that this was coming. Uh, that um, and, and and it was. Uh, uh, we will put a link to that as well. Uh, Brian, thanks so much for coming on. We will be in touch as, uh, as things develop there in Haiti. 
Okay, I'll look forward to talking to you again. And thanks again for having me, Sam.